You're listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. Find the show notes for this chapter at thenexus.tv slash rsj9. Chapter 9. Unemployment Tomorrow. We will analyze the U.S. workforce, layer by layer. I chose the U.S. mainly for three reasons. One, it represents one of the biggest economies on the planet. Two, it has very good public data available. And three, many of the industrialized countries are in a very similar situation. In the United States, as of 2010, there were about 139 million workers, with a population of 308 million. Reference 1. The unemployment rate has fluctuated over time, but the cycles of ups and downs have started to look more like a trend. That trend represents a global rise in unemployment. In 2010, unemployment was 9.6%, reference 2, one of the highest in U.S. history, second only to the 1982 value of 9.7%, reference 3. An even more interesting statistic is the number of working people against the total number of people. In 2000, the U.S. had a population of 281,421,000, with a working force of 136,891,000. By 2010, the population had increased to 308,745,000 but the working force was only 139,064,000. See Table 1.1. There are far more jobless people in the United States and in the rest of the world than you might think. While the reports say that unemployment in the past two years has been falling, the reality is different. As recent as March 2012, Eurozone unemployment hit the record high level 10.9%. Reference 4. But there is more. Figure 1.1, Americans not in the labor force, by age, as of 2011. Image courtesy of CNN, data comes from the U.S. Bureau Labor of Statistics. In 2011, in addition to the millions of unemployed, another 86 million Americans were not counted in the labor force because they did not keep up a regular job search. Most of them were either under age 25 or over age 65. Reference 5. It is easy for politicians and economists to minimize the fear of unemployment. Just change the way you measure and you are suddenly much better off. This is the present situation and is not looking good. But what does the future have in store for us? Let us take a look at the number of jobs per occupation with at least 1 million workers. Table 1.2 number of jobs per occupation with at least 1 million workers in the U.S. Take a good look at the table in the show notes. Now answer this. How many occupations were created in the last 50 years? The 30 occupations listed above make up 45.58% of the U.S. workforce. How many new jobs were introduced because of the advances in technology? The answer is only one computer and software engineers. The profession barely makes it into the list at all. In fact, if we were to exclude the bottom two, we would still have 44.12% of the economy represented, and not a single type job was created in the last 50 to 60 years. The reality is that the new jobs created by technology employ a very small fraction of people, and even those jobs tend to disappear soon after they are created. Think of the jobs created in the IT industry in the 1980s, and how many of them survive to this day in 2012. If you were a programmer back then, or a system administrator, and you did not study and learn the latest developments, it would be very hard to find a job for you today. How many occupations were created because of the introduction of a new technology, only to disappear because an even newer technology came along? New jobs require a high level of education, flexibility, intelligence, entrepreneurship. Most people have not been trained to be like that. 
In fact, our entire educational system was created just after the Industrial Revolution, with the idea of creating factory workers. They needed manual jobs, repetitive jobs, and our educational system has not been sufficiently upgraded since then. The economy has been in need of a different breed of people for a long time. The process of changing that is very slow and hard, however. One reason is because the teachers themselves have been taught to be like that by the previous generation of teachers. Standardized tests, standardized courses, standardized exams can only result in standardized minds. Students are not encouraged to challenge the textbook or the teacher. They are not encouraged to work in groups, to collaborate, or to find different solutions. Reference 6. They have been taught that there is always a solution. There is only one, and it is in the back of the book. But do not look, because that is cheating. Reference 7. The reality is that there are many solutions to an infinite number of problems. Some are better than others. Sometimes there are no solutions at all. Sometimes the solution can only be found in interdisciplinary thinking, by collaborating with people from different areas of specialty. There have been attempts to reform the educational system, and some great experiments are being performed. We shall explore this in more detail in Part 3, Solutions. But the educational system is an even bigger and slower elephant than companies are, and it will take a long time before it adjusts itself. The question is, can it be quick enough to adapt at the same speed of technological advancement? I do not think it can. A few people will be smart enough to adapt to this paradigm, if you are reading this book, it means you are already thinking about this problem, and you have a good chance of being in that tiny slot. But I fear the population at large will be in trouble. Just to see what the trend is, let us examine some of the biggest and most successful companies, listed in chronological order. You can see the year they were founded, the number of employees in 2012, and the average revenue per employee. Table 1.3 List of multi-billion dollar companies over time and their revenue per employee. I think you get where this is going. Newly created multi-billion dollar companies do not have strings attached, such as old workers from previous generations, so they can focus on efficiency from the start. Big companies with more than 20 years of age are like old elephants, trying to move through a very crowded place. They are heavy and slow. They have lots of excess baggage, reference 8, bear with me, which they would like to get rid of, but they cannot. New companies do not have these problems. They are agile. They can hire the best and only the best from the start. They encourage automation rather than resist it. They deploy all possible strategies to increase productivity, that is, the revenue per employee. Look at Table 1.3 again. McDonald's was founded in 1940, and the revenue per employee is $60,000. As we move towards present times, we see a progressive decrease in the number of workers, except for Walmart, but we saw before how that is likely to change pretty soon, and an increase in the amount of wealth each employee creates. The last and most striking values are represented by Facebook with a mere 3,000 workers, where each one is creating more than $1.4 million of wealth for the company. One could dismiss Facebook as just vaporware, a fashion that will soon be phased out. But consider this. In today's economy, one of the most valuable assets is not represented in physical goods. It is information. Personal information about us, our habits, our wishes. Who our friends are, who we date, what we think. We have become the product. Facebook has the most extensive database of personal information ever created in history, approaching 1 billion users worldwide and growing. Governments, companies, and intelligence services long for that information. In fact, there is a significant amount of speculation that Facebook may be selling our personal information to such institutions for profit, reference 9, even though Facebook has rejected such claims. Reference 10. Regardless of the veracity of these accusations, it is without a doubt that Facebook has an intrinsic value much greater than its total revenue. 
a number that is already impressive on its own, considering how little time it took to reach $4.27 billion with just 3,000 employees. So if new industries only need highly educated, smart, and dynamic people, and old industries are replacing human workers in favor of automation, what will you do with the millions of those who have no formal education and do not have the means to even start learning sophisticated skills? I noticed two types of reactions from economists when confronted with this very simple question. The first type does not see the problem to begin with. They do not believe technology is displacing human labor, so they do not even begin the discussion. The second type claims that people who make such arguments should spend less time talking about what they do not know, and more time doing what they are good at instead. They say that people like Martin Ford or myself are simply ignorant of economics, and that if we were economists, we would know better. That may be true. After all, we are not economists, and we might be wrong. But that is not an argument. It is circular thinking, a self-reinforcing tautology with no substance. If you think you have a better argument, and you stand by it, then please present it and enlighten us. I asked many economists, and I am still waiting for such arguments to be brought up to me. The refusal to explain is probably because they feel like this is basic economic theory, things that I should have learned in academia, and there is no point in wasting time explaining it. But whenever I hear this kind of reasoning, I am reminded of what the great Albert Einstein said, reference 11. If you can't explain it simply, you don't understand it well enough. With years of experience in spreading scientific education and debunking climate change deniers, creationists, and all sorts of nonsense, I can see how Einstein's quote could not be truer. If mainstream economists see me as I see proponents of intelligent design, it should be pretty easy to refute what I say. In fact, it should be quick to dismiss my claims with a few simple examples. After a year of research and discussion, I am still waiting for them. Marshall Brain, author of Robotic Nation, gave a talk about job displacement due to automation at the Singularity Summit 2008. At the end of his presentation, he was ridiculed by one of the other speakers. Have you ever heard of this discipline called history? We've gone through the same crap 150 years ago, and none of what you say has happened. This is the sort of easy criticism that uneducated people make very lightly. It did not happen in the past. Why should it happen now? First of all, there is simply no historical precedent for what we are about to experience. While it is true that we found ways to change occupation by inventing new jobs and new sectors altogether, there are two crucial aspects to consider. 1. There is a physical limit to what the human brain is capable of. Sure, our brains are very plastic, reference 12, and with training can greatly improve over time. But just as our physical strength, however much we train, has been greatly surpassed by that of machines, so will our mental faculties. Biological evolution is simply too slow compared to the speed of growth of artificial and machine intelligence. Eventually this might change, but only if we allow ourselves to be enhanced by machines by merging with them. But I do not want to get into that discussion, which would require a book of its own just for the technical aspects, let alone the ethical implications. Let us stay focused and grounded. We know that the second technology-enabled species, intelligent machines, is coming, and unless we prepare ourselves, we are going to be in trouble. 2. Have we ever considered the possibility that finding a job replacement, no matter what, might be the wrong choice to begin with? I'm sure that, potentially, we can come up with millions of all sorts of useless jobs in the future. Just a glance at what we have accomplished in the last 50 years should be enough to make that argument very credible indeed. We have long since decoupled the usefulness of a job with its purpose. Historically, the purpose of jobs has been to make what we need to live better. Food, clothing, houses, roads, cars, etc. But as productivity increased exponentially, we could have easily gotten those things by working less. Please note that this is not an ideology, nor is it wishful thinking. It is mathematics. Suppose you require X amount of labor to produce Y level of wealth. 
Then, after 50 years, you only need one-tenth of x to produce the same y. It is a logical inference that you can work less to produce the same as before. Obviously, the workload cannot be reduced at exactly the same proportion because advancing technologies also increased our expectations as standard of living rises. But the necessities of life have barely changed at all. We do not need 100 times the amount of food, water, and housing that we did 50 years ago. We could have easily reduced the work week. Instead, we work more than ever before, on average. This is pure madness. The purpose of technology was to free our time so that we could dedicate it to higher purposes. Instead, our jobs have become the purpose. In the past, jobs have been outsourced to China, India, Vietnam, and other places where people compete for jobs that in the U.S. and in Europe would be considered slavery. We are talking about jobs that pay $200 a month for a 12-hour per day, six to seven days per week. And people there aspire to get these jobs. They have little to no insurance, benefits, vacation, no safety rules, no right to complain. Sure, if you work there and you do not like it, you can always leave the job, but somebody else will gladly take your place. It should be clear that we cannot think to outcompete them with a race to the bottom by bringing manufacturing jobs back here at lower prices. It simply is not going to happen, nor should it. The days when a high school education, a lot of goodwill, and hard work got you a decent middle-class lifestyle are long gone. Those jobs that have been outsourced are not coming back, period. And even those overseas jobs are now threatened by the rapid advances in automation and robotics. The more companies automate because of the need to increase their productivity, the more jobs will be lost, forever. More than ever, the future of work and innovation is unfamiliar territory. New and exciting fields are emerging every day. Synthetic biology, neurocomputation, 3D printing, contour crafting, molecular engineering, bioinformatics, life extension, robotics, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, machine learning, these new frontiers that are rapidly evolving and are just the beginning of a new, amazing era of our species that will bring about the greatest transformation of all time. A transformation that will make the Industrial Revolution look like an event of minor importance. This new era will create new opportunities, new frontiers for research and innovation that we cannot even begin to comprehend now. I have no doubt about that. The problem is this. Will we be able to keep up with such rapid changes and educate the millions of workers with no formal education for these new types of jobs? I think the answer is a big and loud no. There are millions of workers with a high school education at best, and sometimes not even that, who are over 40 years old who only know how to do either manual labor or jobs easy to automate. Any new job that we can come up with will employ a fraction of those people at best. And these jobs will require a highly receptive, flexible mind with profound knowledge of highly sophisticated subjects related mostly to the fields of biology, chemistry, computer science, and engineering. It can take five to ten years to educate a young mind in these fields, and we are talking about a mind that is not only willing to learn, but that is also enthusiastic about the learning experience. How many of the millions of middle-aged, unemployed people are willing to reinvent themselves and start anew? And how many of those is the educational system able to accommodate? At what price? Even assuming that most of them do find the intrinsic motivation, how many can afford the time and the money required to upgrade their knowledge and skills? Most countries can barely manage to educate their children, and even so in most cases with disastrous results. I find it hard to believe that the government will magically find a way to make university-level education free for all, including the millions of new students that will suddenly have to go back to school at 50 years old. The idea that society can keep up the number of jobs given the exponential expansion of technology, the rise of automation, and the widespread development of cheap personalized home manufacturing is simply unrealistic. 
I have read several books, watched hundreds of debates and interviews on this subject, and I have not so far heard a single argument to support the idea that we can make this work, or how. Technological marvels like Watson are now starting to make even the hardcore skeptics suspicious. The old jobs are not coming back. The new jobs will be highly sophisticated, technically and creatively challenging jobs, and only a handful of them will be needed. The question is simple. What will the unskilled workers of today do? So far, nobody has been able to answer that question. The reason for this, I think, is because there is no answer. Not in this system. Not in the way it is designed to work. I think that if we want to solve this most challenging problem of our time, we will have to rethink our whole economic and social structure. Rethink our lives, our roles, our purposes, our priorities, and our motivations. It is time for a paradigm shift, one that will radically revolutionize our social system. In this universe, change is the only constant. Learn to love it, embrace it, and you will succeed. Fail to predict it, resist it, and you will be swept away by the torrent of change that is about to crush our civilization as we know it. At this point, you might be wondering, will not these highly sophisticated and technically challenging jobs be automated eventually? Given what we have learned about exponential expansion of technologies, the logical answer would be yes, most of them. Surely we will create new fields of research and new jobs will follow accordingly. But these new jobs will be even more difficult, and the percentage of population apt to those will be narrower and narrower every time, given that the ability for technology to self-innovate is greater and faster than our ability to keep up with it. So this is a dog-chasing-tail argument. The total number of jobs required by industry will be gradually reduced over time, and each time we will have to reinvent ourselves finding new occupations for the newly displaced people by automation. This becomes very tiring after some time. It is a game you cannot win. It is unfair, and there is no way out. One begins to wonder if this is the only way, or if there might be another solution. In the next part, we will explore many candidates in solving this problem of utmost importance. We do not know yet which will be the correct one. Maybe none. Maybe it will be a combination of all of them. Nobody knows for sure. What we know is that we will strive to find the best solutions, using our reason and our imagination. We may not succeed. We may even fail miserably in the process. But we could also prevail, facing any obstacle with courage and strength, looking into the future, advancing and evolving. And I feel that we can only achieve that if we share a common goal. To paraphrase Martin Luther King Jr. and Carl Sagan, we are one planet. We must learn to live together as a family or perish alone as fools. You have been listening to the audiobook of Robots Will Steal Your Job, But That's Okay, written by Federico Pistono, read by Ian R. Buck. This audiobook is a production of The Nexus TV, a network of technology-focused podcasts. Find our other shows at thenexus.tv. This audiobook is released under a Creative Commons Attribution Non-Commercial Sharealike 3.0 Unported License. So feel free to use any part of it as long as you link back to the original page. You do not use this for any commercial purposes, and you release your version under the same license. Until next time, have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological technological convergence. Convergence. We're presented with so many choices in our lives, how do we make sure we're making sound decisions? By getting a second opinion from an informed source, of course. Lucky for you, the hosts from across the Nexus use lots of hardware, software, and media and analyze them on our show, Second Opinion. From reviewing the latest phones and laptops to pitting apps against each other, we've got you covered. 
Find us on our website, thenexus.tv, or by searching for Second Opinion Reviews in your favorite podcast player.